Hi, this is Dr. Rodney Davis, and I want to welcome you to the Global Researchers Association uh, Conference being held in Baguio City. And uh, certainly, uh, you've, you've heard a little bit about me from the host, uh, Dr. Uh, Brigido Corpuz, a dear friend of mine. And so, hello, uh, Guido. Sorry I can't be with you uh, in, in person, but uh, I think that our time together is going to be uh, well spent because it's my task to take a look at the uh, conference theme and maybe put it in a, a different light. Uh, as as we are professionals in higher ed and uh, understand this this uh, relationship and and that's really what I want to talk to you about in the next 30 minutes or so is the relationship between uh, education and research you're at a wonderful ho hotel and I understand that there are quite a few uh, presenters that are going to be following this session uh, today on uh, March the 4th. So uh, get ready for just an exciting time. Sorry I can't uh, be with you to hear all those uh, presentations. But uh, I will be in the Philippines uh, the first weekend in May and so hopefully many of you uh, will be around for some of the conferences that are being held then or in June. So let's go ahead and get started with the presentation looking at uh, the research and educational relationship and academic convergence. When I first thought about the topic uh, that I am addressing in this conference, I've spent some time really reflecting on it because the topic is one that it doesn't easily fit in a category. When you're thinking of a keynote address, you're kind of expected to give an overview of the topic, the theme that everyone is at the conference to hear and to participate in, and they're going to present research along these lines. But as a keynote speaker, I've got to tell you this is a hard task because we're talking about a convergence of research and education. I think we all know that there is a relationship there, and I'm going to talk about that relationship as we, we get into the presentation. But putting a, an accurate description uh, before you uh, of that relationship is not an easy task. And so what you're going to hear in the next 30 or 35 minutes, hopefully, is me clumsily trying to pick away at this relationship so that I can expose it to you in a way that you would understand. So I'm going to talk about not only the relationship, how we got the relationship and, and really just the nuts and bolts, the, the, the heart of the relationship, but I'm going to also talk about the issues that have to be addressed in light of this uh, new relationship uh, or fairly new relationship. The connection between research and education is not a new one. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, in his uh, writings, talk about the relationship of the teacher and the researcher being one and the same, and that it is the work of the researcher that drives the educator to the classroom to share what he or she has discovered in the research. But it is that pressure to have to deliver to students that drives the professor to conduct research. So this idea of an, a dynamic relationship between research and education is not new. It's hundreds and hundreds of years old. But we have recoined the name and we talk about here, and we'll talk about later on, this relationship uh, in, in maybe a way that, that you might be familiar, that having to do with 
academic productivity and and scholarship as a part of your teaching duties. So yes, the relationship is not a new one, uh, but maybe in this conference we're going to look at it in a new way, and you'll gain a a new respect for it because we cannot teach effectively if we are not conducting research. Uh, we cannot have anything to share in our classes if we are not researching the discipline for which we have been assigned to teach. So I am an instructional leadership professor. And so I need to constantly keep myself abreast of what's going on in instructional leadership. What principles must deal with on a daily basis. And, and I do that when I come to the Philippines. And, and look for opportunities to talk with school principals to see what things are happening in Filipino schools and how that might be different than what's going on here in the United States. So the, the educator in higher education really must have a research background to carry out his charge of teaching. And researching for the sake of researching is pointless. If someone is not sharing what we learn from our research, it really indeed is, is a waste of time. We're adding to a body of knowledge that is no longer alive. Uh, we, we talk about the body of knowledge in each of our disciplines and how it is a living uh, organism because it's constantly changing. New things are added, old ideas are tossed out. So it, it is constantly in change. But the reality is if no one is using this information, what's the point of, of collecting data? What's the point of doing the research? So it is the task of the teacher, the professor, to take the research and put it in terms that the college student can understand. The college professor must translate the research and show how it is relevant to the student in 21st century America. This is no easy task. Not because the research is so difficult to understand, but because the research is so commonplace, it's so exhaustive, and with the internet, we have the ability to put our hands on so much research, it would, would boggle the mind where to start, how to filter all that we know. Uh, and, and put it in a format that students can use and benefit from, they, they can work with. So it does take an educator who understands the research so that they can put it in a form that makes sense, break it down into smaller parts so students can interact with the individual parts and, and make sense of them. The convergence in the work of the researcher and educator is being made possible because of the technology. As a matter of fact, technology is changing the relationship of research and education. It is making the convergence possible. Students expect technology to be part, a huge part, of instruction in the 21st century classroom. They will not just settle for the professor uh, to shift from using an overhead projector and displaying transparencies to using PowerPoint. They fully expect that the instruction is going to be integrated with technology. They want to use technology to complete assignments. They want instruction that is delivered over the technology. They cannot accept the logic that they must come to the classroom for learning to take place. They want professors to use the internet to make learning a 24 hour a day enterprise. Now that may not be the case in the Philippines yet, but it is going to be uh, a reality even in the Philippines. We are seeing it here in the United States. Students want online learning. Yes, they love face-to-face -face classes, but because we're dealing with busy professionals, their time is limited to how much they are willing to devote to attending class amongst all the other things that they are expected to do. We can also see that how research is conducted is changing. For the last 20 years, it's not been necessary to go to a library on campus to find research material. Most of the resources are not 
uh, available in print, they are only available electronically. Full text versions of the major academic journals are available and more and more titles are being added all of the time. Now many of the journals only publish their editions electronically. No longer are print versions available. This is not to say that what is in print is no longer valuable because you certainly uh, can make arguments for that. But what I am saying is that there we're no longer required to spend hours in the university library seeking out the resources we need to conduct the research. We can actually do that from our office and that's what many professors are doing. Technology is also changing how we collaborate and how we present our research. Skype and FaceTime are just two of the many programs that enable people to see and hear each other in real time. It's so much easier to collaborate on research when you can see and hear the person with whom you're working. Google Documents is another program that allows two or more people to work on the same document and they don't have to be physically next to each other. They can be around the world. De technology has improved so much that we no longer need to travel to make presentations before learned societies such as the one that you're attending right now. You see, I can be in the United States making this presentation. I could do it live. This one happens to be recorded and that's only because uh, of issues of connectivity. But I could do this just as easily uh, live. But I've recorded it so that you can benefit from this even when this, the conference is over. You can have a copy of this presentation and you just give a, uh, a flash drive to the conference host or the MC, and I'm sure they'd be very happy happy to give it to you. So technology is changing how we present uh, our, our research. We, we don't have to travel and in many cases universities are not uh, paying for the travel uh, like they did in the past. It's very difficult for universities with declining enrollments to justify sending a professor or even two professors to a conference that may be in Kuala Lumpur or somewhere else. So technology is changing the dynamic relationship of the researcher and educator. It's making it possible for one person to do both jobs. Historically, the role of researcher and that of educator have been separated by a wall of isolation. Simply put, the functions of a researcher and that of an educator are very different. Efficiency demands that those that are best suited for research should do that, and those that are best suited to teach should do that. But in addition to efficiency, there is the reality that time is an ever-present reality. We only get 24 hours a day. Research, plain and simple, takes time. Education, on the other hand, while driven by time, only can afford so much of it. Students must progress through their programs of study and eventually graduate. It would be impractical to expect researchers to do their work as if it was on an assembly line, but educators are all too aware that their students are on a conveyor belt, and before you know it, you have a new batch of students to teach. Educators are there in the classroom working with the students. Their job is to provide answers to the questions that students have. Another facet of the job is to take the research and describe it in such a way that it's understandable and meaningful to the student. The work of the educator is driven by schedules. There are always lectures to prepare and students to teach and meetings to attend. The source of their passion is seeing others understand a new concept. On the other hand, the role of the researcher is quite different from that of the educator. The researcher's job is to seek answers to the questions that matter. Time is not so much an issue. Research takes as much time as it takes. Answers to complex problems do not come overnight, but must be coaxed out of the data. The work of the researcher is not driven by schedules or lectures, but by investigation of a problem. 
problem. Researchers are driven by a passion to know and understand why a process works the way it does or how one variable affects another variable. Within the last hundred years, though, the wall between the disciplines of research and education have begun to crumble, and the divergent roles have become less clear. It's become more fuzzy, this line between research and education. It has only been a little more than a hundred years that professors have been responsible for teaching and research. As more money was available for higher education, a greater pressure was placed upon the faculty to conduct research that was ex externally funded. The idea of publish or perish, which I think we are all familiar, was born in 1938 with the book by Logan Wilson, The Academic Man, A Study in the Sociology of a Profession. This book put a name to a situation that was becoming all too common in higher education. Professors were not only expected to deliver top-notch lectures, but were supposed to have a vigorous research agenda. For those of us who have been teaching in higher education for some time, we understand the dual role and how much of our doctoral coursework did not prepare us for this reality. Those that are in current doctoral, doctoral programs have been made aware of the teaching and publication responsibilities, so they are much better prepared. They, are all, they already have publications to their credit when they accept their first position in higher ed, and that is becoming the norm here in the United States. Many universities will not consider an application of a professor for a tenure-track position if their VITA does not include some public and this is even true at the assistant professor level. As you look at these new roles here on this particular slide, you'll see that uh, some, of, some are new to you. First, on the education side of the pyramid, there is the recruiting task, the second one from the top. Reports are telling us in the United States that college enrollments have remained consistent. They are not in decreasing, nor are they increasing. Faculty are expected to do their part to encourage students to enroll in programs. On the research side of things, professors are expected to seek external funding to support their research activities. That's the second one from the top on that side. As research institutions, it is not uncommon for professors to have to raise one and a half times their annual salaries to support their research agenda. This money is used to hire lecturers and graduate assistants to handle some of the teaching loads so the professor can engage in research activities. Two questions tend to guide this convergent relationship. Uh, from the researcher, when they look at a phenomena, the question that comes to mind is, what's going on here? Or what's causing this phenomena? But from the educator's point of view, they look at a phenomena and they ask, well, what do students need to know about this phenomena? These questions tend to frame this relationship. And I think it is these questions that, that professors ask that I think makes this new role very exciting because we're not just limited to uh, taking material and making it uh, understandable to students. We're actually going out and testing theories what's going on with this phenomena so we better understand it so that we can take this back to our students and say this theory works and I have tested it and I have seen the growth and here are my findings to support it. Because you see in education especially many times professors are telling pre-service teachers what they should do in, in certain circumstances, how they should teach, how they should grade, how they should assess, how they should analyze data. But there's a question of credibility. In many cases, professors have not been in a K-12 classroom, and I'm thinking just those of us that teach in the College of Education, in 15 or 20 years, and maybe even longer. So. I have no problem with a student questioning, well, how do you know that this works? Well, I can cite the research. 
out there. And I'm sure I can find uh, a handful of studies that would support pretty much every strategy that I tell my students to employ. And there are probably just as many research studies that say that that strategy doesn't work. So what makes me credible with my students is being an investigator of the strategy. Knowing the strategy so well because I've looked at the data that supports it so that I can talk intelligently to my students and say, and here's why the strategy works. Here's the underlying theory that grounds this particular research. So professors have to be a little bit of a researcher and they have to be an educator at the same time because that's what brings the relevance of what they're telling students to do in the classroom because they have looked at the research. They maybe have conducted the research so that they can say with great a great deal of confidence, I know this strategy works and here is the reason why. But with this new relationship, that of a combination researcher and educator, there are some issues that we are going to have to keep in mind. First and foremost is the amount of time that we have uh, to conduct research, to teach our classes, and, and to service our students. Let's face it. Professors work long hours, and nowhere in the world do they work any longer than in the Philippines. When professors may have five or six prep classes that they teach every week, uh, the, and the expectation to be a part of meetings, faculty meetings or committee meetings, and then on top of that, they have uh, research responsibilities, publication responsibilities. Uh, we can see that, that professors today are torn in many different directions with lots of things uh, vying for what limited time that we have. Now, if you look here on this particular slide, number seven, and you see the breakdown of the uh, researcher professor's time during the week. And this is just the, the, the week time uh, that are devoted towards uh, academic type pursuits. So 17% of their time is spent in meetings. Uh, another 13% of their time is spent answering email, which may not be as big of an issue uh, in the Philippines, uh, but it is here in the United States. As a matter of fact, I think that some research reports recently have, have indicated that uh, most professionals spend about two to three hours a day uh, writing and responding to email messages. Uh, and, and I'm sure that varies by uh, business or discipline, uh, but I can tell you uh, I get a, a wide number of of emails every day. I'm on multiple distribution lists. Uh, because of the way I teach, I teach online predominantly, I am on uh, four distribution lists for the Troy University. Four different campuses send me information about campus activities. And most times that information does not relate specifically to me. Uh, and so of course you have to weed through that stuff and, and, and discard what you don't need. So about 13% of their time is spent just looking at emails. And then 35% of the time they're teaching. And that doesn't just include uh, standing in front of a classroom because you've got to, you've got to factor in uh, teaching takes preparation. At least good teaching takes preparation. I suppose you could get up in front of a group of students and just wing it. And by wing it, I mean just get up there and start talking and chatting. I've seen professors do that. But I've got to tell you, most professors who do that do not do an effective job of conveying information. And then, of course, uh, you've got 30% of your time spent 
uh, dealing with non-academic related activities. So this is where you've got about 12% of your time uh, preparing maybe for instruction or dealing with instructional issues. 11% uh, of the time course administration. So therefore 12% of that time referring to grading and putting assignments up or making assignments available. Uh, and then what that leaves you with during your working hours, uh, you've got about 5% of your time to do research. Not a lot of time because in some of the studies I've looked at, uh, the amount of time you devote to research increases the likelihood that you're going to be productive. And most of the studies that I have looked at, especially the longitudinal ones, say that if you want to increase your research productivity, you're going to need to spend a minimum of three hours per day uh, engaged in nothing but just doing research. Then you look at the weekends. And it, uh, for many professors, there is cl class preparation work that you're doing. Uh, some of you teach on the weekends, so of course you know that that might be done during the week. But I know many professors in the Philippines who teach on the weekends as well. Then about 13% of your time is spent with any kind of administrative duty related to a course that you're teaching. About 10% of your time doing email. And now look at this other statistic at the bottom, 9% of your time is spent in some kind of professional development. Here at Troy University, we have just been told by our dean that we must uh, engage in two professional learning activities uh, per year. And that is in addition to conferences that we might be speaking at. So like this event, I'm, I'm with you now. Uh, well, that's that. They certainly encourage this. This could not be counted as a professional learning experience by itself. I would need to have two in addition to just this one. So, as you know, then that keeps you very busy as you're looking for these opportunities to uh, engage in professional development. So, the upshot of all this is that. Boise State University professors, and, and they, I, I wouldn't say they are necessarily typical, but for the most part, I think that it's probably comparable, work about 61 hours a week uh, on their work as a professor. That's a huge issue as you start to see this balance between research and uh, the uh, educational responsibilities that we're, we're given. So a second issue that comes as a result of this convergent relationship that I've been talking about uh, for the last few minutes is the pressure that we feel uh, to, to be both uh, innovative researchers and effective educators. Now, this increased pressure much of the source of it, we, we have to, to give to ourselves. We're very competitive as professors by nature, and we want to do a great job. So we make choices about where to spend the limited time, as I told you, the 61 hours a week that we have. Where are our efforts going to have the greatest impact? That's the question that we have in our minds. Once that decision has been made, other endeavors must take a back seat or second place. There are three sources of pressure for faculty, teaching, researching, and publishing. And as you know, that's half of the relation, two thirds of the relationship that we're talking about right now, teaching and doing research. And those are sources of pressure. Teaching not only involves the delivery of information, but developing the material you're going to deliver. I can remember when I first started teaching in higher ed, how many hours and weekends I spent developing materials for my classes. Because I knew the content, but you still had to put it in a form that you were going to use in the classroom. And, and I can remember just being exhausted that first year of higher ed as I was learning new classes and, and every term. 
every semester. Uh, it was a, a new experience. Oh, I got three new classes that I've got to prepare for and figure out what the assignments are going to be. And then not only once you came up with the assignments, you had to grade them. So there's a great deal of preparation that must take place before you ever stand before the classroom, at least for those of us who consider effective teaching. Those professors that employ other teaching methods beyond lecture must also craft the learning activities that are that the students will use to master the content. Of course there is the grading of assignments that take place and it's a large part of the professor's time. Lastly, even though not mentioned, time must be taken to serve the students. This includes advising them in their programs of study as well as professional advisement. Many of my students contact me uh, daily to ask questions about courses, about assignments, and then they'll say, well, you know, I've applied for a new job and I, I want to be an assistant principal. Can you write me a letter of recommendation? Absolutely. I'm happy to do those things. But each of those activities take time. Uh, and then, of course, we could even talk about uh, time that, that must be devoted to university activities because not only do we just sit and teach, uh, I can't tell you the number of committees at the university that I'm on, and they have meetings, and, and there are assignments for these meetings, things that you have to do. So teaching and all the things that we place upon professors certainly add to this pressure that we feel. Uh, the next pressure, pressure comes from the research itself. Many professors only conducted research for their dissertation during their preparation program, so they lack technical skill. I'm sorry, that the, in most programs there may be a quantitative, a qualitative research or an advanced research class, but there was not a class that dealt with how to teach in higher ed, and unfortunately the only research that most of us did was the research we did for our dissertation. That does not give you sufficient experience to conduct the research that's being required by most universities today. It just doesn't. They may have only taken a couple of courses and since you've only taken those two courses you really can't say that you have a, a depth of, of knowledge using that. I can remember taking one course in statistics in, in my higher ed prep program and uh, that did not prepare me to use statistics in, in my research. So now I, I, I go to a colleague who who studied uh, statistics and, and is really good at it and he's just a huge help. So in addition to the issues related to technical skill, some professors don't have a developed research agenda, so they're having to spend time deciding what they're going to research. And you know, you kind of think that we all have areas that we're interested in, but let's face it, a lot of us have not developed a research agenda. Now, I'm at a university that does expect you to have a, a fairly active research agenda, and we're evaluated on that agenda and, and how we're, we're working through it. So, uh, and I would suspect that's true in many universities in the Philippines. Lastly, there is some pressure that comes from the publishing process itself. Once the study is complete, and you're ready to submit it for publication, the question of where to submit it comes to mind. I've got a research study that I'm working on with another colleague, and that's going to be an issue as to what journal do we submit this to. Some research institutions require that professors only publish in peer-reviewed journals that are only at the top level, tier one, of standings in academia. Those journals have extremely low acceptance rates. Most have acceptance rates of 10% or less. This means that they reject 90% of the submissions. Where this becomes problematic is that these journals only publish five or seven papers per issue, and therefore they have far more manuscripts than they can possibly use. The review times can be so long where which, do, which doesn't help the new professor who has only five years to prepare for the tenure process. I mean, can you imagine? I had a colleague who wrote uh, for a, a journal. I, I, I don't know if it was necessarily a tier one. It could have been a tier two journal. But anyway, uh, I helped her with it and, and did some of the, the rewrites for her, helped her with the rewrites. Uh, it took her 13 months to get a response from the journal 
about uh, areas that she needed to address before they would publish it. That was a year and, and one month. And so we quickly made the changes and submitted those changes. It was another nine months before she heard from the journal. So she was already at two years and she had just gotten the one publication. So you see, professors have to constantly be sending out their manuscripts so that they have a significant number of publications in the pipeline that are be, maybe are in press or ready to be uh, published. And so, yeah, when you have five years before you have to go up for tenure, uh, this many times makes it impossible for new professors to, to submit uh, their their manuscripts to these tier one journals because they have a year or more review process or year long review process. Uh, so this of course underscores the reason why professors need to come to the university uh, already with publications on in in their vita. So you must understand that the pressure that, that professors are experiencing is real. It's not manufactured. And this is part of this new convergent relationship. Why do we put up with the pressure? I mean, we, we, we allow ourselves to be pressured. Well, first I've got to tell you that since the pressure is real, it is not something that we're necessarily allowing to be done to us. Because in most cases, the pressure that we're facing we have little or no control over it. It is pressure that is put on us by deans and, and senior administration. So first of all, I think one of the reasons that we allow ourselves to be pressured comes from the fact that we are pulled in far too many different directions. We're, we're trying to do too many things. We're serving on too many committees. We're being asked to do too many things in order to do both the uh, research responsibility and the teaching responsibility. And I don't fault universities for this. Uh, you know, there, there was a time that if you worked at a teaching institution, there was no expectation that you were going to conduct research. And if you were at a research institution, you were going to be expected to conduct research, but your teaching responsibilities would be handled by graduate assistants, and you might do a lecture here or there, but the bulk of your time was spent conducting research because that's what they wanted you to do. But today, uh, universities are are blending that role. Uh, they're not just research institutions and they're not just teaching institutions. Well, and of course, I should probably clarify that you know, there are some research one institutions. Harvard is a research one institution, absolutely. But those that are there are also expected to teach some, but probably do more research than they teach. But at teaching institutions, the balance between conducting research and teaching is shifting. And where teaching maybe was 80% of your responsibility and research maybe was 30% or 40%, that number is increasing where, you know, now maybe research expectations are at that 50% level. You should spend about 50% of your time doing research. I will not be surprised that before I retire, which is a few years from now, that there will not be the expectation that we have to produce two to three publications a year. I, I, I'm just sensing that that is the direction it's going. I think that that's also the direction that many universities in the Philippines are going to go as well. They're going to expect professors to be conducting a great deal of research, which is why the Global Researchers Association is such a valuable association because this is a venue where you can produce your research. There is a journal that uh, the Global Research Association produces. I serve as an editor for the journal. I can tell you that they, they produce a very fine journal. 
And I'm not just saying that because I'm I'm one of the editors. Uh, but I can tell you that this is a venue where you can get your research published, and that's important. So that when you're making presentations, you need to be not only making presentations, but also producing papers that, that can be published. Another reason that we allow ourselves to be uh, pressured, of course, comes down to our own feelings of anxiety. Uh, when we're new in higher ed, there's always that tension of learning the curriculum that I'm going to be teaching, but also getting my research going when I'm being asked to do lots of different things. And then finally, uh, I think some of the, the pressure that we put on ourselves comes from our own inadequacy. We, we don't necessarily feel adequately prepared to conduct research or to teach for that matter. And as I've said earlier, that many professors enter this, this profession without any background in teaching. So that can certainly be a challenge. Is there an answer for this? Well, I'm going to pause for a moment because I can honestly tell you that I don't have an answer. You're going to have to be better organized. I think that really is the answer to the pressure uh, that we feel, the issues that are born out of this new relationship. Because this new relationship that we're addressing in this conference is is the new coin of the realm. It is the new way that things are being done. I don't see it going back to the way it was before. So what we're going to have to do is to find ways to be more productive with our time. Yes, that's also going to mean that we're going to have to say no to some things. We're not going to be able to be all things to all people and and serve on lots of committees. We're going to have to be more careful with the time that we have. And we may have to very respectfully uh, explain to our superiors that we can't serve on four committees uh, and, and still conduct the research that is expected by the institution. So, I mean, that's just one, one way. So, uh, becoming more efficient. Uh, collaborating more would, would be a great way to uh, help your research agenda because, again, you're, you're working with more people. So, it, you know, more people, less work uh, for each one. That would certainly be a way. Uh, finding mentors would be also another thing that I think would be very helpful to you as you're learning to uh, be a better professor. You know, talk to those senior faculty members who have been teaching for a long time because many of them would have resources or at least tips that they could pass on to you. So, yes, I think there's something we can do about the pressure. Uh, are we going to eliminate it? No, I think pressure is always going to be part of our job because it just is the reality of higher education today. So the title of my presentation was The Research and Educational Relationship, an Academic Convergence. And what I've tried to do in this very short time that we have together is to kind of shine a light on this new relationship. And, and like I said, it's not that new of a relationship. But it is the way higher education is going to play out today. There there are the expectations that you are going to be a researcher and a professor, a teacher at the same time, and that you are going to have to be productive in both. Technology is what's making it possible for the convergence to exist, but here's the secret. Technology is also the way that we can survive the convergence. Remember I talked about pressure in just the previous slides. Technology is what's going to make it possible. So the same technology that's making it possible for me to be with you this weekend is the same technology that you can use to make yourself uh, more effective as a researcher and as a professor. Well, I've enjoyed being with you in uh, this short 30, 35 minute little presentation as an overview to the conference that you're attending. My information on this last slide shows you how to get in touch with me should you want to. Let me say again that if you would talk to the conference host, uh, 
Dr. Uh, Guido Corfuz. He would certainly be happy to help you get a copy of this presentation and uh, you know certainly uh, connect you and me if you would like to ask questions about it. I've enjoyed being with you. I'm looking forward to joining the Global Researchers Association for their conference in May. Uh, I will be there uh, in person. So if you have the time in May and the interest to attend another conference, I will be live and in person in Baguio in May. I think it's around the second weekend in May of this year, 2019. I certainly and enjoy coming home to the Philippines and we'll be there in May and June. So hopefully we'll get to see each other in uh, real time, face to face. Appreciate so many of you being at the conference last week down in Quezon City. Uh, I think it was at the Camelot Hotel and, and this week you're at the uh, Crown Legacy Hotel in Baguio. So I just wish for you to have an awesome conference these next few days and take care and hope to see you soon.